You see, most of us today, our Americans have been lulled into thinking this because of our educational system. We have worshipped and memorized conclusions and no longer deal with the process of reasoning. And because of that, there are more people upset with the conclusion of a Supreme Court decision than they are the process by which it was reached. But the process by which it was reached will have long-term effects well beyond the issue. And it was just the same with slavery in America. As bad as slavery was, slavery was also an issue co-opted by some very uh, improper reasoning. And because of that, we're still living with that today. So because of an issue we want to eliminate, we make the national government king and we give the president all kinds of executive powers the Constitution never gave him on the excuse of the fact of eradicating an evil, which is a legitimate evil, of slavery in society. Everybody with me? But the problem we've had ever since with that has been nobody was really on their toes, or at least not enough people at that time, recognizing the reasoning itself needed to be exposed. Because that's going to be a major problem. So I, I, I'm, I'm a pastor, and a lot of times at pastors' gatherings, they will recognize it. They, they look at me kind of strange because one of my hobbies is to read Supreme Court decisions. <laughs> and I know that that doesn't go normally with being a pastor. And, uh, but at the same time, it gives me a little bit of diversion. <laughs> but anyway, our topic right now, because we have a lot to cover and um, a short amount of time, and I want to give you a chance to respond and maybe ask some questions. Of course, I'm not going to cover everything. I will go like a house of fire. I will just let the hose keep moving. I'll flash some screens. These PowerPoints are going to be available to you. I'll, I'll hand them over so that you can get them if you'd like for quotes. I use PowerPoint because it allows me to go quicker, cram more stuff in. <laughs> and also you're going to go, gee, oh man, I want to look at that again. You'll be able to do that. And you can ask me about sources and whatnot. So what I'd like to do is to begin, when we look at this and look at what it is, I'd like to read a couple of quotes that might be helpful to you. Um, I've, I've done this a lot more now than I have recently. And when I stop over here to read the quotes, I want you to move this so that I don't get in trouble. You know what I'll do? I have enough, do I have enough to move over here? Okay, I don't want to block you guys, but I'll just, uh, I'll just do it this way. Uh, reading Alexis de Tocqueville and his work, Democracy in America, is very insightful. The reason it's insightful is today we have a, a group of people in America, both in the church and out of the church, that are, are so, they have so little knowledge of the premises and the principles upon which the nation was founded. Whether it's constitutional law, declaration of independence, or going back. 800th anniversary of Magna Carta. I've been doing Magna Carta seminars to show the background to uh, what we did in America, why we went further than England ever went in dealing with our rights. But the, the critical thing is people have so little knowledge about that that sometimes you have to work deductively. You have to look at someone like Alexis de Tocqueville and say, here's an observer about what America was like in 1830. Personally, I look at 1830s as the peak of American independence and liberty. It went all downhill from there, but the idea is that at this point, so Alexis de Tocqueville gives us a snapshot into what life was like in America. For instance, in one of his little chapters in that book, he says it's amazing that in America there are no uh, locksmiths because there are no locks. Mm. Nobody locked their door. There were no gates. Uh, nobody because there was so little crime. So many cities in America had 0% crime rate. Mm. Can you imagine? 0% crime rate. And on Sundays, Alexis de Tocqueville said, it was a ghost town. Everyone was in church. And yet there was no law saying you had to go to church. So there comes this anomaly for a European and especially a Frenchman coming from France when there's a lock, there's ten locks to get in every door. <laughs> then imagine that he's saying, how can America be so free? See, this was his, this was hit him. How could America be so free? Now here's some key quotes. Religion in America takes no direct part in the government of society, but it must be regarded as the first of their political institutions. Now, this was not a, a man who had no knowledge. This was a man that said, my gosh, religion and a religion in America was not tied to the government. You're not forced to go to a certain church. That was ended. We didn't have the parish concept. Everybody who lived 50 miles from a church automatically a member the moment you're born. And we mail you your tithes. I'm tempted occasionally. But the point is, that's not going to work. That's not proper. And it goes in, while I was in America, a witness declared that he did not believe in the existence of God or in the immortality of the soul. The judge refused to admit his evidence on the ground that the witness had destroyed beforehand all the confidence of the court in about what he was about to say. The newspapers related the fact without any further comment. 
Meaning this, that a judge, the guy came in and said, I'm an atheist. The judge said, you can be dismissed. Because when you take the oath, it will mean absolutely right. nothing. Right. And therefore, now here's the idea. Right. This was not written in law. The judge did not have to refuse that witness. It was because Christianity was so alive in the hearts of those who believed it that they were salt to those who didn't. And it was the unassumed, presumed, voluntary basis upon which not only our laws were built, but our whole society. And what a difference that would make. For instance, he goes on, for the Americans, the ideas of Christianity and liberty are so completely mingled that it is almost impossible to get the, to conceive the one without the other. Religious zeal is perpetually warmed in the United States by the fires of patriotism. Now notice this. De Tocqueville is saying, gee, this, this shocks me. Christianity and liberty are so intertwined, no American could think of one without the other. Oh, that's just like today, isn't it? <laughs> no, in fact, the point is, and not only that, religious zeal is warmed by patriotism. Not only does Christianity known to produce liberty, but liberty, patriotism, is known to warm Christianity. Two sides of a coin that doesn't have to be glued together with the power of the national government. In fact, they don't want the national government to do it. It reminds me of a veto statement by James Madison. That's another hobby I have. Read veto statements from the presidents. Especially the first seven. The first seven presidents. So here's Madison and he vetoes this bill. What's the bill? It's the bill from the incorporation of a denominational church. Madison said the following. I don't know why you would expect to put this bill in front of me. I'm paraphrasing. He vetoes the bill because he says this, why would any group of Christians want the government involved in their incorporation? <laughs> in other words, why put a government tie when the whole genius of America was not to have one? Hmm, interesting. In the United States, the sovereign authority is religious. There is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. The American ministers of the gospel take no share in the altercations of parties. They endeavor to amend their contemporaries, but they do not quit fellowshipping with them. Interesting. So the variations between the political parties, by the way, well, whether it's the, you know, the uh, Federalist parties or the, and the Anti-Federalist was a newspaper smear. But anyway, the point is, the, the different parties had their differences and they will have consequences, but you did not find your identity in a political party. You ended up, you did not break off fellowship because of it. See, today the political parties have gone way off. But I tend to think the National Republican and Democratic parties are twins. Right. <laughs> but anyway, that's okay. You, that's free of charge. The point is, American ministers of the gospel then take no share. Look what he says here. Now, now, now when he gets to Islam, he makes a distinction. Muhammad professed to derive from heaven and he inserted in the Quran not only religious doctrines but political maxims, civil and criminal laws and theories of science. The gospel, on the contrary, speaks only of the general relations of men to God and to each other, beyond which it includes and imposes no point of faith. See, now, now here's, here's the Tocqueville saying this, that all the religions, they did not fear the other religions having a sway in public life, but they did have a major problem with Islam. Yes. Because Islam was not primarily a religion, it was primarily a political, yes. political institution that would force religion on people right. that was so contrary to Christianity and contrary to America that even de Tocqueville said, look, and, it, and here's de Tocqueville learning about what the gospel is in contrast to Islam. This alone, besides a thousand other reasons, would suffice to prove that the former of these religions will never long predominate in a, in a cultivated and democratic age, while the latter, the gospel, is destined to retain its sway at these at all other periods. Now, you need to understand, why did the Tocqueville write so much about that? Remember, after the American Revolution, we fought a 32-year war with the Barbary pirates. Right which was radical Islam that wanted to attack America. So the whole United States of America from the 1784 through the 1820s was in this massive three decade long war where we have commentaries from Washington, Jefferson, Adams and others, the lessons they learned should a future generation of Americans ever have to fight such a war. That's a different workshop. But that's a good one to realize this. People say, this is unprecedented. We've never faced an enemy like this. Someone hasn't read their history. Right. And isn't that a shock?
<laughs> well, the point is, I say these things to you to make a point. Uh, Peter Schaff, the church, uh, church historian, made this even better analogy. And I'm reading this to you because I want to just bring you to some key points. What is the distinctive character of American Christianity in its organized social aspect and its relation to the national life as compared with the Christianity of Europe? Now this was so common now and I'm, I want to make this clear because when we talk about religious liberty we do have to distinguish. The framers and the founders spoke about American Christianity not out of pride but as distinct from European Christianity. There was a reason. They believed American Christianity was a purer strain of Christianity. As Sam Adams said, it came from Christ and the apostles, not bureaucracy from Europe and bureaucracy in the church. It's interesting because American Christianity was a more purer strain, they said, because we got off. Like Sam Adams, we have no longer bowed down to the, um, the ethereal nether stone, as he called it, of the previous European Christianity which built on system. See, in, in America we had this battle that went on between the Anglican church at the time and the Congregational church that had grown up in New England. There were battles over land, there were battles over all buildings and everything else. And those in the colony said this, you're very different. You worship your service and your system. We worship God so we can have fellowship under a tree. Mm -hmm, right. You have to have the building, we'll give you the keys to the building and we'll worship under the oak. Because they believed they were freer. You follow me? They were not bound by a system. Important to note, because this has a lot to do with the how we treated religion in America. And it says here, it is, now here's what he's saying. Now in America, it's a free church in what? A free state or a self-supporting, self-governing Christianity in independent but friendly relation to the civil government. Civil liberty requires for its support religious liberty. Cannot prosper without it. Religious liberty is not an empty sound, but an orderly exercise of religious duties and enjoyment of all its privileges. Best sentence now. It is freedom in religion, not freedom from religion. As true civil liberty is freedom in law, not freedom from law. Very good observation from Schaff because we recognize the following. It's self-supporting Christianity. Now you have to understand we came from Europe because we came from Europe the early constitutions including my own in Massachusetts had the state supporting Christianity financing the ordering of churches. In the state constitution of Massachusetts they did that until the town could pay for its own preacher. And the reason they did that just to give the idea is this civil government and civil liberty can never operate in a limited fashion unless Christianity is voluntarily embraced in the community. That's what they said. The day Christianity becomes no longer the voluntary religion of the people is the day they will clamor for civil government to answer their every need. Because no longer does God meet their needs and therefore the God becomes the civil government. And cradle to grave security. They look to civil government the way that you went to God. God, give me my daily bread. Lord, help me find a job and help change my character so that I love to work. <laughs> <laughs> and then they get enforced from the pastor. Don't become lazy. A growling stomach is the best method God uses for you to get work. Right. <laughs> Preach it, so if you don't, if you have a lousy work ethic, don't feed that person with private charity. L pray, and if you do feed them, tell them, I'm going to give you this food for five days, and after five days, you tell me how many jobs you've applied for. Don't work, you don't. So the point is, but Christianity taught that, so they would say, gee, we have to be very careful in dealing with that, because it's independent, and eventually it became independent. We inherited this from Europe and it took a while to do it. Now, if Schaff goes on, there's a very great difference between toleration and liberty. This is very important to understand. All right, toleration is a concession which may be withdrawn. It implies a preference for the ruling form of faith and worship and a practical disapproval of other forms. You can, by the way, put in toleration, you can put in the synonym of privilege. Privileges. And it goes on to say that it may be coupled with many restrictions and disabilities. We tolerate what we dislike, but we cannot alter. We tolerate even a nuisance, if we must. In our country, we ask no toleration for religion and its free exercise, but we claim it as an inalienable right. 
Freedom of religion is one of the greatest gifts of God to man without distinction of race and color. He is the author and Lord of conscience and no power on earth has a right to stand between God and the conscience. Now, that's almost a direct quote from Thomas Jefferson in his Virginia Statute of Liberty. Uh, we could go on. It's the religion is the duty you owe to your creator. Now keep in mind I'm going to make some comments on how the framers viewed religion. It's very important. Now when he says religion, you have to understand, if you take the word religion and define it in Webster's 1828 dictionary, which gives you the dictionary definitions at the time period, you'll find that Webster simply says, the variations of the Christian religion. Right, right. Variations, all other religions are false ones. Right. So in other words, he makes a distinction that there are some religions that do not produce the fruit of civil liberty. Well, I get in debates like this all the time, and I say there are not every religion produces the same quality of liberty. There are certain religions that by their very tenets would produce slavery for the individual. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we have to understand, the question is not whether religion should be respected in America, but which religion gives the greatest amount of liberty to those who disagree with it. That's the key. So when he's looking at this, he says, look, you, you can't, you claim it as a right. So let's review just, and I, I don't have the exhaustive time. I'll, I can exhaust you. <laughs> but I'm not trying to. But I don't have the time to go into more depth on this, but to say, let's make a summary, which we could claim and we could show you from the framers' own writings. First of all, they believed all law was religious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Think with me for a minute. I mean, I, I, I remember, I, I talked to legislators, and I try to train legislators running for office, I'll say to them, listen, they'll say, well, you don't want any religious law. I said, no, the only difference between canon law and civil law in history is canon law is simply formed within the church, only applies to the church. Civil law to society. But every law is built on a religious tenet. Every traffic light law is built on sanctity of life. The only reason you have order and you drive on the right-hand side of the road is so we do not kill more people. The way the reasoning is today, if we took the reasoning of the Supreme Court decision, which we'll delve into a little briefly, and we did that, if we took the reasoning, if I feel like I'm being harmed by not being allowed to drive on the left-hand side of the road, I should be allowed to drive on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> After all, I feel freer when I'm on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> The only problem is I'm more dangerous on the left-hand side of the road. <laughs> and what right do you have to tell me I can't drive on the left-hand side of the road? After all, that's where I feel. I feel like Europe has it right. And they drive on the left-hand side, so why can't I? And on and on it goes. And I'm telling you, this is what the problem is when we don't analyze the reasoning. Right. We've got a transplant. I teach, I have a couple of students here, and they know this. If I teach on logic, rhetoric, or elocution, I will tell them one of the best methods is to take a premise that you're dealing with and transplant it into an absurd area. Yeah. So that you can see how ridiculous that will be. Sam Adams did this well when he wrote under the assumed name Publius in the newspapers, because his best friend was the editor of the Boston Gazette. That's a good thing if you have a good friend to do that. And he said this, he used the absurd analogy because he said the following, well, if you allow the T on tax to go through, the British are going to take that seed of an unconstitutional tax that they passed upon us, which was unconstitutional in principle. Do not be deceived by how small it is. Two pennies on a pound of tea in a year. Don't be too, don't. If, if you let them do this, he used two absurd analogies. Someday, the British government will think of taxing land. <laughs> the response was, what? <laughs> then he said, not only that, someday they'll think of taxing income. Oh, oh my gosh. That's terrible. And of course, if he lived long enough, he would have found out Karl Marx thought of both. All right, the point is, <laughs> American Christianity, religious, religious liberty, is unique for its voluntary and not forced on anyone in contrast to European Christianity. Do you know what natural law is? Yes. We'll talk about natural yeah, I'll, I'll, you can, you'll bring it up a little bit later. Now we'll go into the distinctions there. But here we have, so it's voluntary. So this is what made American Christianity so unique, voluntary and not forced. Religion, the establishment, as well as the freedom to practice it, free exercise, is protected by law, not just tolerated or permitted. See, if it's permitted, the civil government is sovereign. We will let you worship. Just don't get out of line. Mm -hmm. We will let you do that, have your freedom. See, now it's called freedom of worship. Right. Mm -hmm. No longer are they dealing with freedom of religion. Because the idea is, 
we get used to it and we say, okay, all right. So the civil government is accommodating, my, giving me a privilege to run a church service on a Sunday morning. No. No, they're not. That's, not, that's what they think they're doing. But that's the way it's working. Yet actions that violate the law or rights of others can be punished. So in other words, what do you do when it conflicts? Because when you have completely conflicting religions, certain religions teach one thing and it's against the law on the other. Because we had to have some religion become the ultimate base of law in America. But not tie it to the law in such a way that it begins to be abused by civil power. How do you do that? Well, the quality of Christian life, here's what the framers said, the quality of Christian life practiced by individuals will either preserve or diminish religious liberty. This is the way Madison said. The reason why the preamble says, and we will secure to ourselves and what, our posterity. You see why this, this, the blessings of liberty, the word blessing in law, deliberately means it has to come from God, not government. Right. You cannot be blessed by civil government. You can only be blessed by God. Right. You know, when the civil government knocks on the door, we're here to help you. <laughs> That's not a blessing, okay? Most life, it's more control, all right? So the point is, you realize that there's, a, there's an aspect of this that's very important. This is what the framers believed. Madison said this. He said, if the preachers don't do their job, if nobody preaches and nobody receives Christianity, why, if we had a decadent group of people, why, the whole thing will crumble. Republic will crumble, liberty will crumble, it'll all crumble because that is such a powerful force in the society, but it cannot be financed and propped up and forced by civil government or it's a different form of religion. And then it's worshiping the state. Look, individuals who claim rights in conflict with or by attacking blasphemy Christianity were not protected. Just like that witness who said he was an atheist, the judge said, well, you know, how can we believe anything you say? If you're an atheist, you don't, you don't take an oath for anything. That's why even Quakers who wouldn't take an oath, they began to reason with them and say, look, I understand you don't want to do this, and even some of the framers said, until you're better informed as to the teachings of Jesus, but the point is, you don't want to take an oath, and we'll just call it an affirmation. Look up in the dictionary, it's pretty much the same thing. And the Quakers went along with that because they recognized they're not taking an oath, but they are taking an affirmation. And the reason was, if you didn't do that, if there was no oath taking at all, if you didn't think you had to keep your oath, I mean, why take it? Today, putting your hand on the Bible means very little to most people. Right. It means nothing anymore because we're no longer, and we teach it. We teach it, why should there be any absolutes? I mean, I'm the absolute. I can do what I want. And it seems so free, but it's really not. And I won't spend much time on this, but just to tell you this, the way the law of God was written in the Old Testament, from a theological perspective, I deal with this a lot, in the Ten Commandments themselves, the way the Ten Commandments were written, first four to God, second six to man, gave you two tables of the law. The reason why those two tables of the law were so important is that only the, the first table of the law was for the church to enforce, the second table of the law was for the state to enforce. And therefore the state was never to enforce the first table of the law. That was only given to Israel for a short period of time. In fact, the theological roots would say that the religious liberty is the protection given to an individual for his own beliefs. Do you know even under the Old Testament Ten Commandments, there was a provision that someone who didn't believe in Jehovah could actually be tolerated for his disbelief until better informed and not necessarily punished. You can read it in the Old Testament. There is a provision of toleration even under the tight theocracy, uh, theocratic, it was a theocratic republic under Israel, but still uh, under that time. So religious toleration is temporary permission to practice one's faith. Now here's where we're going to have a, a problem. Even though most people are see the errors of the Supreme Court decision that was recently decided, the reason I'm spending this time in laying a groundwork is this. It's simple. Because you have to recognize that in dealing with that, what's happened today is most Christian organizations are actually saying the fight is over getting the civil government to agree with accommodating us. To give us religious accommodation. Religious accommodation is giving us toleration which is temporary. Now I agree that you can start reasoning from a position like that, but that better not be your goal. Are you with me? Because yeah. if that's the goal, it's bringing all religion under the state's control. You follow me? When it brings all the religion, we acquiesce the position often when we do not reason on the proper principles. Does that make sense? So, we're, we're to, see, when America was founded, Christianity was the presumed base of the law. In fact, if you look at it in the New Testament, 
you find the following, and I won't spend time on this because of our, our time here, but for instance, Romans 12 deals with the responsibilities of the church. Romans 13, the responsibilities of the state. Do you know all six commandments of the second table of law are repeated to us in Romans 13, but none of the first four commandments. Why? They were not given to civil government. Civil government is not supposed to punish you if you believe the wrong God. If you're going astray. Otherwise, we're going to give a bureaucrat the responsibility to keep the church pure? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so, okay? Now, <laughs> the point is, in England, that was European Christianity, correct? The state was over the church. And the state tried to keep the church pure until the Puritans realized they, they made it all corrupt. And so because it was corrupt, we wanted to leave. So I come from Plymouth, Massachusetts, separatists. Mm -hmm. That left because they said, you're not going to purify that system because we don't want a Christianized system of toleration. We want to be separate. So when we look at the establishment causes here, and we take a, just a quick purview through the First Amendment, and we're just we're going to look at the establishment, this is a key statement to understand. And I'm, I know I'm going quite quick, but that's okay, all right? You'll thank me later. <laughs> maybe, maybe, I don't know. The Constitution, the First Amendment notwithstanding, did not establish religious liberty in the United States of America. It's important to recognize that we did not get anything out from the Constitution. Are you following me? Sorry, yeah. uh, for instance, I, I had a student, we were on a candidate forum, and I have my students pick, uh, pick campaigns and they, they, um, they go through it and they bring them in and they you know, they, they have it all written out. Well, I, I've had, they get on the phone with them, and we have this eight questionnaire, eight question questionnaire they have to write in complete sentences. What's the purpose of government? What's the, and you know, a lot of them have never been asked these questions before. So one of them, I had, an eight, I, I had a girl in ninth grade. She's a feisty girl, man. She, she would fight for things. And so I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assign her one of the more liberal candidates. Because so she gets on the phone with this liberal candidate. I come back from a meeting. I come walking in the church, and the secretary meets me at the door. He says, Dr. Jelly, there's a candidate in your office, he won't leave. <laughs> so I'm thinking, all right, this is, this, is, this is candidate season, so I'm dealing with all these candidates. So I come in, he's pacing back and forth in front of my desk. He's still, he's, he's got all the buttons on. I mean, he's a legitimate candidate. So I said, what's the, what's the matter? I said, what's, what's up? He goes, Dr. Jelly, your student called me up last night. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what did she do? Oh my <laughs> word, it's dangerous. Unleashing students who've been taught constitutional law on candidates. But he said this, he goes, he goes, well, he said to me, she said to me, where do rights come from? I said, well, what do you mean, where do rights come from? She goes, where do rights come from? You're running for office. Where do rights come from? He said, I, I thought, where do rights come from? He goes, in every television debate, every single, no one ever asked me that question. <laughs> he said, so, I said, I'll call you back. <laughs> so what he did was, he went back to his textbook, his political science textbook in college, and then he called her back. He says, I called her back. I called back your student. <laughs> so I said, yeah? And now I'm thinking, this is, this is great. Go on. He said, I called her back. And I said, okay, I looked up my political science class, and I figured this out. Our constitution in America gives rights to the states, and the states give rights to us. Oh and, this is what she, and this is what your student said. I said, go on. Your student said, oh, so you don't believe the Declaration of Independence. And I said, well, what do you mean? Declaration says our rights come from God. And then by our consent, government operates. I said, I'll call you back. <laughs> so then he goes and then he said, I read the Declaration. And then I called her back. And then he looked at me and said, it's a ninth grader. <laughs> he was going crazy because of this. Now remember, because he didn't understand even 101, she was incredulous. She said to me, Dr. Jelly, I'm very sorry. I didn't want to make him so mad the next day in class because I said, come here, I need to talk to you. <laughs> but anyway, I said, she goes, I didn't really want to make him that mad, but I said, I thought he was joking. <laughs> I know you said in class that you know, today's candidates might not believe what we're being taught, but come on, that's kindergarten stuff. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the point is that we recognize this. It didn't establish, why? Because this is not generally recognized today. There is a pervasive myth that Americans have always had a constitutional right to religious liberty. Again, what it is important to recognize is that religious liberty, or the lack thereof, was left up to each, what? 
State. state to work out for itself without any federal oversight or interference. Eventually the states all disestablished their quote state church and adopted a position of religious liberty. But it is important to note that this took place after the ratification of the U.S. Constitution, took place voluntarily, not as a result of it, and that it took place before the 14th Amendment even came into existence. Because uh, Louis de Boer, great author, we have a book called Lord of the Conscience on the history and meaning of the First Amendment. I, ex I think if you're interested in religious liberty, you need to get that book. It's a short one, too. You can get through it pretty quickly. Well written. Now, what's the point of all this? Religious liberty came from the bottom up, not what? The top down. The Constitution was to protect the freedom of the states. Every state could be as religious as they wanted to. So Maryland was a Catholic state. Massachusetts was a congregational state. You see, we recognized, we recognized that Rhode Island was a diverse state. Had all kinds of religions equally represented. We could go on and on through the colonies, and every colony had more or less to degree a specific denomination of Christianity that they rested, they rested on. Until about the 1840s or 50s, when most states voluntarily, on their own, disestablished any financial aid from the state to any brand of Christianity. To make sure all were equal before the law, at the same time retaining the fact that voluntarily, without government tie, Christianity was the basis of our laws. Knowing this, that if some other religion was the basis of the law, not Presbyterianism versus Anglicanism, or, or, or not Congregationalism versus Catholicism, although they had a concern for Catholicism in this regard, not Catholics, they said we have a concern for Catholicism because they all think in centralized top-down form. And therefore, we don't want them to incorporate that into America because we're a bottom-up, inside-out government and very different. But you see, in dealing with this, we recognize that the preamble, even to the Bill of Rights, think of it this way. Now notice, the preamble's never recorded. This is before any of the Bill of Rights are written. It says, the conventions of a number of states, having at the time they're adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers. Ooh. So the Bill of Rights was actually written to prevent misconstruction and abuse of power by the national government. Well, that's interesting. That further declaratory and restrictive clauses be added, and as extending the ground of public confidence in the government will best ensure the beneficent ends of its institution, be it resolved. And the first phrase was the preamble to everyone. Congress shall make what? No law. Meaning, the Bill of Rights was a stop sign to the national government in relation to the states, every one of them, including the First Amendment, to say, stay out of our lives in petitions, in right of assembly, in guns, in all those, all those areas, in forcing us to quarter anyone or house anyone or feed anyone. You know the root of that amendment? The government can't force you to buy anything. <laughs> anyway, just throwing that in. Alright, so the point is, Ninth and Tenth Amendments clarified it. The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to disparage others retained by the people. Powers not del delegated to the U.S. by the Constitution or prohibited are reserved to the states. So when we deal with the actual First Amendment, the Establishment Clause, and free exercise, keep in mind that at that time, 11 of 13 states required one to be a Christian in order to be elected. Massachusetts said you had to say, I believe in God, believe in the Trinity, believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't even be considered to be governor or any elected official. Eleven of thirteen states. So it could not have meant that all religion is out of government. Right? It definitely meant that at the national level, stay out of us. States could be as religious as they wanted, the no religious test clause, Article 6. I get this all the time. I get in friendly debates with people. I try to be friendly. I am. I'm really a nice guy. You know, you, you can ask the students. Better tell them the truth. Okay, but the point is, if, if that's the case, they say to me, oh, this is a secular government. We, we wanted nothing to do with religion. In fact, we want to get rid of religion because there's no religious test for the national government. You know, you know who fought for the no religious test? All the pastors. You know why? They did not want the national government to think they had any power over religion. So bottom line, stay out of our religious life. At the national government, that's the last thing. Someone said, well, what if an atheist is elected president? You know what the framers said the first 50 years of our republic? If an atheist is elected president, what has happened to the people? 
That means they're practicing atheism. Why? The only way that would happen to, paraphrase Hamilton, Madison, the only way that would happen is that people have to become so ignorant as to what someone believes and so passive as to give up their voting that it would happen by default. Gee, I don't know what they're thinking now. The states could be as religious and we, we look at this. Now, matter of jurisdiction, two days before Congress approves the First Amendment, they paid chaplains to open in prayer. So they're out, not anti-religious. One day after, Congress asked Washington to play, proclaim a day of Thanksgiving. So it's a separation between the national and state governments. Then, you know, the modern idea, I won't take time on this, but you understand believers retreat from the entire culture for that for 30 year period, reaping the consequences. Since the Civil War, we begin interpreting the Constitution as a living document. Um, it's too bad that we did not do what we could have done, which is outlaw slavery by the pen. So we didn't have to do it by the sword. Because when you do it by the sword, you get unintended consequences. And the consequence is a big fat government and a fatter presidential executive. Uh, you know, I'm not trying to refer to Howard Taft and a few others. But the point is, still, the fact of the matter is, the executive got very, very big. We've embraced the philosophy of positive law, permit law, which means you don't have the right to do it unless government gives you permission. That's what we call permit law. That was Roman law. Roman law, you couldn't even build a deck on the back of your home without the permit of civil government. Can you imagine that? You couldn't even ride, you couldn't even go along the road without a license. You couldn't even deal with your liberty without an actual license from Rome. Because it was all permit government. It was permission. Whereas we had liberty. Where liberty meant the only time that you ended up with laws intervening is when you violate those laws and when you curb them and when you cause other people harm. Therefore, you get punished. We don't punish the group for the sake of an individual. We punish the criminal for the sake of rehabilitation. Rather than sending the prisoner to jail, have everybody rehabilitate the prisoner by tax, supported. That's the idea that because we as a society created the criminal, we're going to pay for it. But the original system was very different. After the 14th Amendment, then the Bill of Rights was used to restrict the states. And you know about the, the phony separation of you know, church and state phrase, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, now, in you know, marriage, when we deal with this marriage thing, why is this in introduction? And now I can just fly through this because why is this so bad, important for us to do? We need to realize Christianity was voluntary in the hearts of the people. They say 90% of Americans at the time of the revolution were Christians by their own voluntary consent. Only 10% were not. So because of that, the people they predominantly elected would be what? Have the same kind of view. They did not want the national government telling everybody they must be Christian in order to vote. They didn't want that. Because that gets easily corrupted when it gets in the hands of government. They wanted a jurisdictional separation of church and state, but not an ideological one. Jurisdictional meaning church can't go governing the state, and the state sure can't go governing what? The church. So states stay out of church affairs. And, you know, church, you can't go in there and start running the halls of Congress. Can't do that. So there was this idea. And what this, now here's the key thing. This supposedly was going to discuss whether the 14th Amendment required every state to license same-sex mar same marriages. We'll talk about the consequence. One major problem is the assumption that they need licenses. Second here, all states must recognize same-sex marriages if they're fully licensed. In other states, you know Article 4, uh, the uh, clause where if it's done in one state, the acts should be respected in another state. Now, here is the major premise of the decision in the in the area. That due to the harm inflicted on some, the court must legislate and not wait for the states to do so. Okay, now it's just the whoa, 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 Justice Kennedy, hold on just a minute. I have to tell you that reading this Supreme Court decision, remember I read them at night for a hobby. <laughs> I've read a lot of Supreme Court decisions. And when I was reading Justice Kennedy's, I'm actually reading it on vacation. But anyway, I'm reading it and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh, I can't believe I just heard that. That really, because some people feel harmed by not being able to be included under marriage licenses by the state, that that's why we should force the court to legislate because they can't wait any longer for the states to do so. Not only is it unprincipled, has nothing to do with the Constitution, but it is a, uh, a court decision on feelings. Now listen, I have no disparage toward my homosexual friends. I have individuals that I talk to regularly. I discuss these things with attorneys for the gay lobby. And I'm telling you right now, when I discuss it with them, I discuss it with one gentleman, I said this, you should not be rejoicing on this decision for your clients. And he said, what do you mean? Why not? 
I said, because of this. Do you really want all the statistics that are going to come with divorce and marriage run by the state? Do you really want to come under that control? Do you really want a government granted privilege and right? What, why do you want that? And you see, do you really want to deal with it this way? Because, you know, personally, I argued with one person, instead of arguing for more entitlements, let's argue for none. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. Wow, that's radical. Then they call me radical. <laughs> Justice Kennedy, he said marriage has evolved over time. <laughs> Arranged by parents, then it was led by males, and then racial. Of course, they didn't, he didn't start at the beginning. I never saw Genesis quoted. Not right. <laughs> Homosexuality is normal, immutable, and because of that they want to join, not redefine. That's not true either. Right. It is a redefinition. To exclude them from benefits produces harm. Now here's the interesting thing. I want you to understand the process of reasoning. If you start reasoning that the reason someone should join something was because they perceive that they're receiving harm by not being in it. You have just wiped away. Let's, let's do some absurd analogies. Doesn't matter what club you have, if you have any membership qualifications, those go out the window because someone feels harmed that they can't join your organization. Are, are you with me? Because they feel excluded because you have a membership requirement. And do you follow me? Forget same sex. Deal with the principle of what's happening here. Then all of a sudden, you can't have any membership requirements because someone feels harmed by being able to come in there. You can't have a border because someone feels harmed if they can't come in. And if somebody has entitlements, then oh, I want entitlements too. You see, I've had people argue with me. Well, then let's have, you know, and they say, well, from a Christian perspective, we should have totally open borders. I said, yeah, like the kingdom of God, right? You can climb in the back door if you want. No, you can't. Right. This, look, all reasonable issues, borders make good friends. It's nice to know where my friend, my neighbor's property ends and mine begins. We have discussions on the corner. You know, I want to dump some of my junk. I said, like, no, let's go down. I, first of all, I know my neighbors. They know me. So we can talk about that. Okay, if I dump this stuff, I know it's technically on your property. Oh, I never go to that section of the yard anyway. Okay, good, but the wall makes a good neighbor. All right, same-sex couples seek in marriage the same legal treatments as opposite-sex couples. And it would disparage their choices, diminish their personhood to deny them this right. And yet it should say deny them this tolerant privilege given by the civil government that will enslave your future choices if you take it. That would be my additional clarification. Chief Justice... The Chief Justice said, the majority graciously suggests that religious believers may continue, this is the dissenting opinions now, continue to advocate and teach their views on marriage. But the First Amendment guarantees whoever the freedom to exercise religion. Ominously, that is not a word the majority uses. Unfortunately, people of faith can take no comfort in the treatment they receive from the majority today. It is one thing for the majority to conclude that the Constitution protects a right to same-sex marriage. It is something else to portray everyone who does not share the majority's better informed understanding as bigoted. See, I'm just choosing clauses that deal with religious liberty. But you know what he's saying? He's saying it's no longer. If you disagree, you're automatically what? A bigot. A bigot. In fact, goes on, Scalia says, it is not of special importance to me what the law says about marriage. It should, but that's okay. It is of overwhelming importance, however, who it is that rules me. Today's decree says that my ruler and the ruler of 320 million Americans coast to coast is a majority of the nine lawyers on the Supreme Court. The opinion in these cases is the furthest extension of the court's claimed power to create liberties that the Constitution and its amendments neglect to mention. Good statement. See, here's the reasoning. If this Supreme Court decision is accepted passively as law, which it is, being accepted that way in most cases as law, if it is, it means we have swallowed a principle that we can be ruled by the majority of nine lawyers who create rights out of nothing. That's more important than the issue it decided. Are you with me? Much more important. In fact, Justice Thomas, man, I like reading his decisions. I usually save his to last so I can go to bed at 2 in the morning with a little hope. Okay? I save his to the end. The court's decision today is at odds not only with the Constitution, but with the principles upon which our nation was built. Since, now listen to this. Since well before 1788, 1787, liberty has been understood as freedom from government action, mm. not entitlement to government benefits. 
Wow, there it is in a nutshell. There's the whole thing. It's the idea of getting more entitlements, which always will happen when you offer some in the first place. Right. <coughs> and of course, okay, Thomas goes on aside. From undermining the political processes that protect our liberty, the majority's decision threatens religious liberty. In our society, marriage is not simply a governmental institution, it is a religious institution as well. It might change the former, but it cannot change the latter. The majority goes to great lengths to assert that its decision will advance dignity. But here's what Thomas says, and know who Thomas is. Human dignity has long been understood in this country to be innate. All humans are created in the image of God and therefore of inherent worth. What Thomas goes and says, the major error of the decision is not just in the conclusion. Thomas says the major error is you get your dignity from government. But he says you get it from God, not government. And he's right. And he's correct that that's what made America unique. You don't get it from government. And Alito, probably the most chilling that people have quoted, today's decision will be used to vilify Americans who are unwilling to assent to the new orthodoxy. I assume that those who cling to old beliefs will be able to whisper their thoughts in the recesses of their homes, but if they repeat those views in public, they will risk being labeled as bigots, treated as such by government, employees, and schools. The system of federalism established by our Constitution provides a way for people with different beliefs to live together in a single nation. By imposing its own views on the entire country, the majority facilitates the marginalization of the many Americans who have traditional views. Uh -huh. Now understand, there's a distinction between whether you agree or disagree on the definition of marriage. I am a Christian. I am a, I'm a pastor, an evangelical pastor. So my definition is settled by God. I, I didn't have to come up and struggle with that definition. But I can tell you this. In dealing with people, we have to be very clear. Do not roll the two into one. The most dangerous part of this decision is the court went further in enunciating principles opposite to our founding than has ever been put together in one decision. Are, are you with me? So that beyond the issue, beyond marriage, it is an issue that makes us more centralized as a nation, more top-down, fewer rights. In fact, all of our rights come from government. Therefore, we have to sue the government to get our rights. And therefore, when we're persecuted because of who we are, we have to go to government and ask them for an accommodation. That's a problem. Because we've begun to think that our rights are government-granted and no longer God-given. So where do we go from here? How do we deal with it from here? Well, you know what? Now there are 58 legal identity genders. Um, actually, all 58 are listed on Facebook. Yeah, you can, you, can, you can go there. So there's all kinds of variation because you know why? Listen, folks. This is not... I'm, I don't make fun. I'm a pastor. I deal with people that are struggling with who they are. And I will always take my time, and I will love them, and I will work with them. And I will work with them for hours, if needed. And I have. That's not my point. My point is this. The moment you say, as Ben Franklin said, if you begin to think of government as doling out money to people, people will move heaven and earth to qualify. That's right. They will go, go for that. So if you say that a certain gender comes with entitlements, you're going to expand genders. Why? You want the entitlements. Are you following me? This is not a slam on people who have a difference of opinion or even are struggling with who they are. The issue is we have a wrong process of thinking here. It's not going to bring dignity to people to hand them a check and to give them money. It's not going to work. It's not going to solve the problem. Uh, now here are the consequences that people are saying. The removal of all gender identities in law has already started. So that states are going through their laws, so no longer is there any mention of male or female in their laws. No men's or women's bathrooms, we know that's already been uh, dealt with, but there's no, no aspect so that there's no gender. We're becoming a genderless society. Polygamy, obviously, and one of the justices said in the dissenting opinion, he said this, he says, why are some people balking at polygamy? If you take this decision, polygamy was one step from where we are same-sex marriage was five. If you take five, you've already taken one. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the idea now that's coming is polygamy. But polyamory is different, which means marrying anything you love. Mm -hmm. Since that's the premise, we've already got a guy who has, wants a marriage certificate to marry a bridge. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. 
Why? Why would he want to marry a bridge? Because of all the benefits that come with a partner that gets state money. <laughs> Why do some people want to marry their cat? That saves an insurance. Folks, do you understand that people are then shocked? They said, how did this happen? Because the reasoning, are, are you with me? Yeah. The reasoning, the premise is going to lead to these conclusions. It's naturally going to lead to these conclusions. And you bring up natural law you know, and natural rights. The phrase from the framers, when they would say a natural right, it did not mean a right given to you from nature. If you go back and look at it, it meant God gave you that right and it is so and intertwined with your nature that it is unalienable or inalienable. It is a God-given right, so it is called natural. So it is because it's a part of your nature. Natural law was the law that God put into creation. But it cannot be understood without revealed law, as William Blackstone, the jurist, so adequately and eloquently portrayed. But you have these ideas, but we are so far removed from that in our society and in our thinking that we really are thinking. We have to recognize, and you need to have compassion. I need to have compassion. We in this room could finish each other's sentences in many areas. We understand a lot. You come to a seminar like this. You understand more about the Constitution, maybe than most. You've read the framers. You can follow me. I can go 90 miles an hour, and you keep nodding your head and say, OK, then I'm going faster, OK? But the point is, we can do that, but there are most Americans have never been taught Constitutional Theory 101. They don't understand their rights come from God and not from government. We need to be compassionate and begin to share those things and saying it's much better to live in the dignity of being created in the image of God and me not depending on the next handout. Mm -hmm. Don't you want to be in a place where you can give to someone in need not by, because you're forced, because you're moved. Mm -hmm. And you can give to someone in need. Don't you want to be in that place where you're a producer and not a consumer? Don't you want to be in a place where you're independent and not dependent? Don't you want to move in that direction? Yes, I do. Well, here's a path for that, to be able to do that. Well, then what about constitutional consequences? I mean, here's some key questions I think that are going to need to be discussed. And here's the positive aspect. I, I said this once to someone, they said, what? Are, are you, well, what's happening to you? I said, there's some very positive results of this Supreme Court decision. And the person looked at me and thought, oh no, Jay Lee, have you lost it? You've gone insane. That's not, not the first time someone's told me that, but for different reasons. I said, no, I want you to think of this. All of a sudden, even in a presidential debate, someone questioned whether a Supreme Court decision is a binding law. That's right. We've been saying that for years. The Supreme Court, according to Article 3, only has power to rule in the case brought before it. It is not law. They are not a lawmaking society. They are one of the branches of government. They do not can, they cannot say what law is as far as for the rest of the country, and they can't enforce it. Right. There's no police force. They can't enforce it. They can't enforce that Supreme Court decision. So therefore, how does that come? Now, that doesn't mean they won't try, but I'm saying theoretically they can't do that. And the Supreme Court decision does not make law. Wasn't that the, uh, a court that shut the marshals down for Kentucky for the marriage licenses there? There may be, and I'm not saying there isn't. But here's what happens. I'm talking theoretically, the court has no power. Remember, all police force is under the executive. It's not under the legislative and it's not under the judicial. However, that doesn't mean that a court won't summon, they do all the time in different ways, but they're not understanding that the law is on our side, not their side, when they do that. But the idea is, this has now become a discussion. I say that's positive. Okay. That it's coming into the foreplay of discussion, and we haven't had that before. They just shove it aside. They said, Jaylee, you're just living in 1780s. You're born in the wrong century. Go back someplace. But now it's coming up. What about accommodating religious conviction? Now, here's an interesting one. I'm not for accommodation as the ultimate goal. But it is kind of interesting that all of a sudden, we accommodate right now all kinds of Muslims and the Koran and everything else, but we will not accommodate someone who has a religious conviction to even deal with that. In other words, our accommodation is so crazy, what it will do is, by discussing accommodation, it will show us how bizarre and how lack of consistency we are in what we're doing. That's a good thing, because it's gonna expose some real collusion. Oh, how about this? When are we gonna start focusing on co electing constitutional state legislatures? Why is it so important who becomes president? I know the president, it's important. But I put it on a very low pedestal 
compared to state because I'm not looking for the big issue to come from the president. If we, even if we got a constitution, I mean the constitution was actually mentioned in a couple of debates. I'm like, my wife thinks I'm crazy. I pace back and forth. I go, it was mentioned, the C word. It was actually mentioned. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Out of context, un improperly, but it was mentioned. At least somebody's bringing it up. You know, I, I was in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure they wondered why they invited me, but they had this that pastor, about 500 pastors meeting with congressional delegates in Washington, D.C. And I'm there. And wouldn't you know it, out of all that time, I'm the pastor that brings up the C word. Well, how is this constitutional? And the whole thing got thrown into a tell. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's so controversial. Controversial! You took an oath to support it. But state legislatures, I'm telling you, that's where the battle's going to be, folks. Mm -hmm. And how about constitutional interposition by counties and states? County government, critical. Get to know your sheriff. Sit down with them. Become a friend. Take them to lunch. Uh, do whatever you need to do. And do not just go in adversarially. Go in relationally. And begin to do it. Sure, give them Richard Mack's little booklet. Okay, give them some of the materials. Be able to deal with that, but we want to be able to make sure that this is where the, the battle lines are going to be drawn. And what about removing all entitlements to marriage anyway? I'll give it up. I'll say, let's go back to common law marriage. Let's go back to marriage that is a natural right mm -hmm. and go back to that situation and bring it out of the national government and back to the states where it belongs because that's what will prove whether we Christians are salt and light at all. It's local government from the bottom up that's going to be the solution.